Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the fireside chats of this Zero Projects conference. It is the second day, and I'm here again with you. My name is Emanuela Zaimi, and I am the founder and the director of Down Syndrome Albania Foundation. We are in this next 15 minutes together with Mr. T uh, Steve Tyler, Director of Assistive uh, Technology and Transformation from Leonard Cheshire in UK. Um, Mr. Tyler, are you with us? I am, and thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. We would love to have had you here in person, but let's hope next year, right? Indeed. Um, we are going to discuss together uh, today uh, the, the how does the disability uh, inclusive culture within companies, organizations foster innovation. Um, I was thinking that s a couple of years ago, maybe we were not even talking about um, this kind of relation, right? So um, today, why do you say inclusive culture is important also to foster innovation? Would you give us some explanation to this? I've worked in the field of accessibility for the past 30 years, and we've had enormous technical innovation, legislative change, a level, of course, of social change. Um, and in addition, I can point to lots and lots of examples that a lot of us will know that of, of products or services that have been developed purely because the driver has been that of disability. So obvious ones include optical character recognition systems, you know, products that in 1975 or so were launched at 48,000 euros. Um, today, scanning technology on people's desktops at 50, 50 euros each. So many of these kinds of examples, and they have been driven by the needs of people with disability. It seems to me that Although we've used lots of tools, including legislation and standards, we're at a stage where we need to engage culturally in a much bigger way um, with organizations, society, um, to bring about significant change. And um, I think my call today is I've tried to simplify the discussion. Embracing difference. For me, embracing difference is a simple message that people can readily understand. And if you begin to think through what that means around how you treat customers, around how you deliver services, around being genuinely customer centric, that begins us on a journey. I think the disability community needs to come together in a much more significant and joined up way to deliver a unified message rather than what we deliver today, which I believe is a very diluted message. Mr. Tyler, um, well, th of course, there are many um, uh, innovations and, and products uh, out there that has been designed uh, to be used and to be sold out to, to, um, for the needs of people with disabilities. But can we say that we are uh, r going with the same pace also in really, really um, having the, that uh, inclusive culture within these companies, so within uh, their staffs and, and also within, um, so when they are designing this, these products, uh, people with disabilities are there in co-designing and co-producing. Can we say this or not yet? We've got a long way to go, mm -hmm. um, but I would draw attention firstly to a session tomorrow, the ILO uh, session, um, International Labour Organization, where Accenture, ATOS, GSK, Repsol and Standard Chartered Bank are featuring. But I want to give you a couple of examples of people that I've worked with um, and, and small teams around us have all we've been working with that really have demonstrated cultural change and real alteration, customer centricity, and genuinely living the message. An obvious example for me is, is our friends and colleagues at Microsoft. 
genuinely buying the t-shirt around embracing diversity yes. recognizing that by embracing diversity um, by definition you're beginning to reflect a diverse society lloyd's bank de developing best-in-class apps i hold them up as examples um, because they've conformed with standards they've centered on what the customer really needs and understood the customer need london underground one of the oldest transport networks on the planet actually has a turn up and go service Hardly any transport systems in the UK certainly have that. People who have focused in on accessibility stand standards like retailers, Ocado in the UK and Morrisons and people like that. And then those guys who want to deliver the best in class proposition. I think of Apple, I think of Amazon, big players who have genuinely committed to, 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 the, to the arguments. But in order to bring about sustainable change, I believe there's a real issue. Mm -hmm. And if I may, yes. I'd like to just give you some numbers because Please. they highlight for us the statistics. So our latest research, really, it shows, frankly, despicable situation around um, people with disabilities. So 23% of recruiting managers in a recent research study that we conducted, recruiting managers who knew who we were said under no circumstances would they recruit a person with a disability um, even if everything were equal or even if the disabled person had 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 higher qualification uh, or ability to do it 76 percent of people who involuntarily lose their jobs in the uk do so as a direct result of long-term disability or um long-term condition as defined by um, disability disability legislation so we we've realized that the cultural challenges that we have are enormous although we've got lots of tools and capability to remedy the situation you really need to get past the genuine fear or misunderstanding or frankly the belief that you can buy yourself a problem or not buy yourself a problem. Disability, people with disabilities are still, I'm afraid, seen as something other, seen as something different. And that's why I want to focus so much on the disability community and the unification of our messages. You only need to look at the headlines today. You mm -hmm. know, when you look at the numbers around people with disability, one billion globally. In the UK, one of the uh, foremost, apparently, economically strong uh, countries uh, in, in, in the world, sixth strongest economy or whatever, 14.4 million people with disabilities. It's still unshiftable over the past 30 years, um, issues around employment. And I would say one more thing from an education perspective, and it begins with education, even universities and colleges reflect the numbers that I've just given. Just over 22% of colleges and universities, when they're approached by people with disabilities um, versus uh, um, an able-bodied candidate, 22% simply didn't respond. Well, <laughs> yeah, this is this is these are worrying statistics, uh, and. Um, that's why I, I keep asking again, are the companies more running into selling products to our community? But what is holding many of them? And uh, we shouldn't be speaking only about the big, big players, the, the, the corporates with huge number of, of employees. What is holding the others back um, to embrace inclusion? Knowing that it can be also beneficial, as we said, in terms of um, innovation um, processes. Um, wh what is this? And, and then you mentioned that we, we as a community should, should come together and speak the same language um, to change this. But um, for example, you mentioned the 23% of the HR recruiters. Did they give any reason that why they would still not choose a, a candidate uh, with disabilities, even when they have all the requirements to be to fill in that position, it's seen as a problem. 
And I think fundamentally, it's simply a problem. It, it, is this a, a mindset mix. problem? Is this, do you yes. think it's a mindset problem? So a should we tackle yeah. as organizations, maybe increasing or, or trying to understand more, what's this problem? What, what, what is there? What's the fear? I think th that's why I want to, that's why I think for me, the organizations that re represent people with disabilities and represent the accessibility movement, I believe that unification in some of this messaging is absolutely crucial. So if you think on a really straightforward level, I guess, you know, so if we pick sensory impairment, blindness versus deafness. Deaf people require things that they can see. Blind people, as a rule, require things they can hear. Right there, that's seen as a com conflict. If you begin to sort of delve into more detail, so if you look at children coming through the education system across Europe, who say uh, 30 years ago, the, what we would refer to as visually impaired children, 34% of those today are visually impaired but have additional or complex requirements and quite often their learning requirements. So all of a sudden, rather than um, people feeling that they've got a handle on what these mean, what this means for their organizations, I think quite often, very quickly, it's interpreted as a problem and a challenge, and frankly, something that you can do without. And yet, we do know that if you look at you know the success that I used of um, Microsoft as an example, and uh, uh, and many of my colleagues will, you will all know how wonderful over the past few years, especially, massive accessibility shift at Microsoft. Part of that is the conceptual idea that is simple in nature, difficult to deliver on, but simple in nature. It simply says, if our organization represents what's outside our organization, if we're made up of diverse people, just like the diverse people that uh, make up society, then chances are we're going to deliver born accessible product. And, and I think that is the critical piece. And to do that, we need a message right across our um, colleagues. And, and, and for me, the call to action, I guess, today is we need to unify around that inclusion and diversity equals innovation message. We need to unify around the embracing difference message. In other words, rather than where I'm talking to you, my assumption is, broadly speaking, we're probably culturally quite similar. We're probably culturally have similar interests, have similar requirements, mm -hmm. have similar, I have no idea. Rather than thinking that, we start from a perspective that says, actually, let's assume that there are at least some significant differences. And right there, that begins to lead to obvious questions. Questions like, how can I make your life easier? How can I be more accessible to you? What do I need to do to make you feel more comfortable? And how can I learn also new things from you, right? So it's not only about asking, um, I mean, doing things for, for the community of people with disabilities, but also In what what can they learn? And, and, and as you were speaking and we are about to finish this session, I, w I had the idea, Maybe one of the things that we need to do is, as organizations, as, as people with, uh, with disabilities, maybe makes, um, look for the partnership of those companies that have embraced uh, inclusion to tell to the other companies. Uh, right. Yeah, th this could be maybe um, one of the strategies that we should work because um, it would work better, maybe. I mean, I the list may be agree. long, but I would. I wanted you to. I wanted to see if you would agree. Example, for example, with such a solution. I, I, I totally agree. I commend to you the work that r raising the bar that Valuable Five Hundred, for example, is yeah. doing. All I'm asking for, and what I'm suggesting, is business one hundred and one. Be customer centric. That's it. Be customer centric, which means understanding your customers and that means diversifying your culture such that that comes naturally 
Thank you very much for being with us, Mr. Tyler. I wish you um, all the best and uh, hope to see you next year here and have the pleasure to talk to you uh, in other discussions. Brilliant. Thank you very much.